you're very welcome to another episode of History Now. Joining me today is Sir Richard Evans. Sir Richard is Regis Emeritus Professor of History in Cambridge and is the author of a number of books on the Third Reich and his best-selling In Defense of History. Today, Richard is here to talk to me about his recent book, and that is Eric Hobsbawm, A Life in History. So Richard, you're very welcome to the show. I'm delighted you could join me today. So Richard, this is a very interesting biography of a very well-known figure who is perhaps the most widely read uh, historian of the late 20th century. I want to ask you about how you approached this book, because you knew Eric Hobsbawm, perhaps in the later end of his career, and you've done numerous appearances with him, media appearances on the radio, etc. I just want to know, does that present any challenges when you're approaching a, a work like this? I thought it was worth writing a full-length biography of Eric Hobsbawm when I was asked by the British Academy uh, to do a, uh, a, a what I call a biographical memoir. So it's an obituary. All the fellows get get obituaries. Um, I went to his house to see if there were any papers, and there's such an overwhelming quantity. I mean, he died at, at the age of 95 and never threw anything away at all. And he was heavily involved in political uh, life. He was born in Alexandria, grew up in Vienna, was, lived in Berlin with his uncle and aunt after his parents died uh, in the time of the Nazi seizure of power, and lived through and experienced, and to some extent took part in many, many major political events of the 20th century. So I uh, thought there were, I mean, I got, there were several potential obstacles. So one <clears throat> was simply the sheer volume of material, most of it completely unknown, but that's also an attraction, of course. It's a wonderful thing to do, to write history from the sources without anything having been written before. There's no other biography. There's another challenge, which was he'd written an autobiography, but it was rather impersonal. And uh, my interest was in the relationship between his, his personal, his private life, and his writing and his political activities. So I could say a lot of things he didn't say himself. And of course, the fact, as you mentioned, that I knew him, uh, but wasn't an obstacle. I wasn't a kind of close friend. Um, I've never been an uncritical admirer of his writings, though I do think they are uh, generally absolutely wonderful, and I've been very strongly influenced by them. But there are also aspects of his political life and I didn't agree with. The fact that he was a communist, I've never been a communist. And in the end, the fact that I knew him was actually a benefit because I could throw in to the story of his later years, which is when I, I knew him from about 1990 up to his death in uh, 2012, I could throw in things he'd said to me, um, things I'd seen him do, lectures I'd heard him give, that, that kind of thing. So I could add that extra, extra dimension. So if we can just bring it back to his early life, as you mentioned, he uh, was born in Alexandria in Egypt in 1917, but he also spent uh, a, a good part of his early life in Vienna. What comes across in the book is that it was in many ways a very unstable um, life in, uh, in his early years in, t in a family sense, but this seems to impact on his education. As you've noted, he was a, a very voracious reader. And given the person that he went on to become, how did this instability in his early life, how did he uh, overcome that? Well, he was um, born in Alexandria because that's where his father, who was British, and his mother was Austrian. And they met there uh, when his mother was uh, passed the school leaving exams in Vienna and was given a holiday with a relation in, in Alexandria, so present by her parents and his, his father was there because he was working for the Egyptian Postal and Telegraph Service, which was run by the British at the time. And they met and fell in love. And uh, they, because of the First World War uh, and his mother being Austrian, they couldn't really go back to Britain. So uh, he was born there, but they went straight back to Austria, to Vienna after the end of the war because um, her parents were better, much better off than, than his father's family. And of course, because his father was British, he was a British citizen all the way through. He was not a refugee, an exile, or anything like that. He was British. He was known at school. And I found, I dug up an, an old school friend of his who was 98 at the time I uh, interviewed him, um, who said that. He said it was um, known as uh, England, uh, the English boy. And he was brought up bilingually which was enormously important for his later life. His mother was a translator uh, from English into Germans, and she insisted they spoke English at home, and actually found his old school reports in Vienna, 
which said that, uh, you know, they came from the Habsburg Empire. Uh, they're still the old printed forms, uh, even though Austria was a republic in the 20s. And there was a box for language, native language, uh, because the Habsburg Empire had, had many, many different languages. And they filled in that with English stroke German. So he was bilingual. He moved, had to move school almost every year in Vienna because his parents ran out of money. And then his father died of a heart attack when he was 12. And another two years, Hobbeswarm, at the age of 14, lost his mother. She died of tuberculosis. And so he went to live in Berlin. So it was very unstable, um, but he was extremely bright. He overcame these difficulties. His school reports are very good, apart from history, actually. It was curiously enough, he got a good in history and an excellent in most of the other subjects. And in Berlin, he went to a very good uh, Prussian style secondary school called the Humanistic uh, High School, um, where the teachers were, some of them were serious scholars in their own right with publications. It wasn't nearly as conservative, I discovered, as uh, he painted in his autobiography, but he got a good education. He, he was taught Latin, his English was excellent, and he then left with his uncle and aunt, with whom he and his sister had to live after his parents had died, uh, to go to London. And they had went to a very good grammar school. He attended Sir Marlborough Grammar School there. Uh, and the teachers then discovered in his mid to late teens how really clever he was, how ambitious he was, and they worked very hard and they put in, in for Cambridge and he had a scholarship to, to Cambridge. So he was from uh, the age of 10 or 11, as you said, a voracious reader. And um, his, he kept a diary. He left, he, I found his diary, it was in German, from 1934 up to 1951. And um, he has these lists of his weekly reading. The diary is in German. <clears throat> he calls it Leser Chronic, Reading Chronicle. And they're absolutely terrifying. I mean, oh God, I couldn't read as much as he read in a week in a whole month. Um, he was just all the time. So he assimilated and retained this vast corpus of knowledge. Interestingly, not just Marxist theory, which he, he read and Marxist writings, but literature, poems, plays, um, novels, short stories, everything in English, French and German. He got to know French really quite well by the middle of the 1930s, by the time he got to Cambridge. He ends up in Berlin at a time that is very um, important in, in world history. It's a very uh, turbulent time, both economically and politically. In the book, you mentioned that as a result of the, the, the worldwide crash and the depression, that it's more intensely felt in Germany. And this gives rise to Nazism. There's an interesting quote in the book where he says that it's like being on the Titanic and everyone knew they were hitting the iceberg. So could we talk about why it was more intense there and what Eric may have witnessed with the rise of Nazism? Well, the depression uh, the, after the Wall Street crash in 1929 affected Germany very badly indeed. The economy really collapsed. There were bankruptcies, bank failures, 35% unemployment. It was in a terrible state. This is the Weimar Republic, a democracy founded after the Kaiser's overthrow at the end of World War I. And German people began to turn against it. Uh, it pol politics became completely polarized between the Nazis on the one hand and the communists on, on the other. And in those days, there was mass violence on the streets, constant parades, demonstrations. The parliament, the Reichstag, was completely paralyzed. And it looked as if the end had come for the Weimar Republic. It was going to be succeeded by some kind of dictatorship, either communist or, or, or Nazi or possibly military. Uh, and that was the atmosphere in Berlin, which is the crucible of German politics at this, this time. And so he joined the Communist Party because he was English and he was Jewish. He was not, wasn't practicing Jew. His parents were secular, but he was marked down as, as Jewish because of his uh, parentage. And so he couldn't possibly join the Nazi party. And the other parties, the middle class parties, the moderate socialists, they were all completely at sea. They had no idea what to do in this 
crisis and the communists and the Nazis seemed to. So he joined the Communist Party and I think it became for him a kind of substitute family after his parents had died when he was a teenager. And um, he stayed a communist with a small C, you might say, mm -hmm. the rest of his life, even after the Communist Party while he collapsed. And he took part in the last great demonstration of the communists in Berlin. They could throw tens of thousands of people onto the street in minutes notice. They had a hundred deputies in the parliament. His sister, who he got to deliver leaflets for the party in North Berlin, though she never herself really became a communist, she, she was, took another direction, um, remembered cycling past the Reichstag on the night of the 27th of February 1933 and seeing it in flames as it was burnt down by uh, a young, young Dutch uh, radical and that led then to the Nazi dictatorship because they then passed a decree to suspend civil liberties. At that point, not long after that, the family left. Not because of that, but because his uncle's business venture in Barcelona had failed. Most of Eric Hobsbawm's relatives were failed businessmen and it's not surprised but it, it, it's not surprising uh, that he thought capitalism was on the skids when you look at that and they look at the terrible disaster of the depression. If we could talk about his, his time now in, in Cambridge University, as you mentioned, he had a scholarship to go to Cambridge University. What is really interesting comes across really clearly in the book is that in many ways he is a figure apart in what was a more conservative atmosphere. There's also the, the case that you described that um, he was very uncomfortable with his own appearance at the time. So could we talk about how he was a figure apart in that and perhaps how he, the influence of one of his professors, uh, Michael Poston, the influence that had on Eric at this time? Well, when he got to Cambridge, Eric Hobsbawm found the kind of environment he'd never experienced before. It was full of public schoolboys who were there mainly for the sports and to have a good time. Uh, it was politically quite conservative. There was a minority of radicals. Uh, and of course, in the previous generation, they'd all left by the time he arrived, the famous Cambridge spies who became communists and then went to work for the government, Burgess, Philby, McLean, Blunt, and so on. Um, so there's a very active left wing there, but the majority of people were neither intellectual nor uh, particularly uh, uh, radical in, in, in their politics. And while... Uh, they were all kind of very, very British uh, and came from this public school background. Uh, he had grown up in uh, Vienna, Berlin. He spoke three languages, English, French, and German. He'd read massively, whereas probably most of them had hardly read anything very much at all, apart from their textbooks. He had been uh, through all these huge political events in Berlin. Uh, he'd uh, been on uh, a holiday in France, he'd experienced uh, the um, upheavals going on in France in the mid-30s, in 1936, of the Popular Front, taken part in demonstrations in Paris, he'd gone to South France, he'd even, even uh, visited Spain in the Spanish Civil War only for a day before he was escorted back over the border by anarchists at gunpoint, all that kind of stuff. There was completely f foreign to all the, almost all the other students. So he was uh, completely out of it. He was also um, uh, very tall by the standards of the day. And of course, he had this famously rather ugly, ugly face, a sort of absolutely distinctive appearance, not conventionally handsome at all. He'd done so much reading that he really didn't think very much of most of the professors who are mostly pretty, pretty conservative and pretty conventional. But the one he did take to was Michael or Munia Poston, who came from a quite a similar background he came from Bessarabia, from, from Romania. He was multilingual. He was an economic historian. Uh, and although Eric never thought he was an economic historian himself, he said that the really interesting thing about history was how you connected the economy and society and culture. This is a Marxist view, obviously. And Poston, because he did that, gave these very dynamic theoretical uh, argumentative lectures, not just cramming the students with facts. He took to Poston, and Poston had this strange relationship with him where he eventually supervised his PhD uh, on the uh, Fabian Society, the moderate 
uh, Labour Party intellectuals like Bernard Shaw and the, the Webbs. Uh, also pulled him out of various uh, academic scrapes he got into. I mean, he submitted his PhD on the wrong size of paper, for example, and, um, which the university wasn't very happy about. It was full scab instead of quarto, and Poston got him out of that one, and uh, and so on. So, but Poston didn't like his politics, and he uh, didn't want him to get a full-time job in Cambridge. So it was a quite a kind of uh, difficult, but for Hobsbawm, very very important relationship. So when World War II eventually comes, um, Eric is drafted into the British Army now, and he's stationed in a number of uh, locations around Britain, uh, completing his army training with the engineers. It seems that for the most part, Eric's war was one of intellectual frustration. Would you say that would be the case? And if we could talk about when he was moved to the Army Education Corps, this is a, a move that he embraced, but you also argue in the book that it's perhaps one that saved his life. So could you talk about Eric's war experience? Yes, he was drafted into the army. He was conscripted just as an ordinary private soldier um, and with a typical kind of cack haddiness of the British army, he was put in the Royal Engineers, although he was notoriously impractical. He, you know, almost he couldn't even change light bulbs as it were. Um, and incidentally, his very close friend and cousin Ron, who was um, uh, had very poor eyesight, was made a plane spotter for the navy. So it's this kind of, it's a, you wonder sometimes how the how, how Britain won the war. Um, but he uh, tried to get out. He tried to get into intelligence, but he was turned down because he was a uh, his mother was Austrian, uh, and uh, although he had a double start first from Cambridge, the top degree, uh, and. Uh, he, in the end, he was transferred because he's, even the army recognised how hopeless he was in the Royal Engineers. Uh, he was transferred to the Army Educational Corps, which was set up to give lectures and education to, uh, to, to the soldiers. Um, and um, that saved his life, I think, because his unit uh, was then transferred to Burma uh, not long after he left it. And of course, then overwhelmed by the um, by, by the Japanese, and and a lot of them died in Japanese camps. If we could talk about a bit more about his politics now at the minute, uh, Sir Richard, in when he was in the army, there's an entry into his diary where in which he says that communism was more of a wish fulfillment rather than practical politics. Uh, could you we talk about what he perhaps meant by that, and further? He was outside of the, the mainstream Stalinist element of the Communist Party. And as you mentioned, he could be called a communist with a small c. But being outside of that mainstream of uh, Stalinist communism, do you think that benefited him, allowing him to associate with a whole host of left-leaning intellectuals, such as you talk about in, when he was in Paris, but also campaigning for left-wing candidates for the British uh, Labour Party? Was that uh, being outside of the Stalinists, was that beneficial intellectually? Yes, his relationship with communism is a very complicated one. He, first of all, he uh, was inspired and politicized in, in Berlin with these massive demonstrations, the hundred deputies in the Reichstag, uh, a real political power. And he came to Britain and there wasn't a single communist MP in parliament until, until Willie Gallagher was elected in 1935. They didn't demonstrate. They were not intellectuals. They didn't like intellectuals very much. Um, it was very much a trade union based party and it was an activist party. You had to be acting, you're supposed to be um, standing on street corners selling the daily work at a communist newspaper. And uh, in a very precocious way in his diary is when he's uh, only uh, 16 or 17, he writes down, he says, I'm, I'm an intellectual. I'm not a bruiser. I'm not a street fighter. I am an intellectual because it's very much uh, a concept that wasn't really uh, kind of current in, in, in England at the time, but he decided he was an intellectual and that's, he sort of stuck, stuck with it really. In his diaries and in his letters, his long diary type letters to his cousin Ron in Cambridge, which served as a sort of substitute for a diary while he, while he was a student and he took the diary out when he was in, uh, in the army again. He really tries to justify uh, all, a lot of Stalinist 
uh, policies. He tried to justify the purges and the um, uh, the executions of, of uh, the show trials of Stalin's comrades like uh, Bukharin and Zinoviev. Uh, he, like many people, not just in the Communist Party, he believed that these leading communists had actually been conspiring against the Soviet Party for many, many years because they gave their confessions uh, in public, in court. We now know that they did that because their families were threatened with being shot if they didn't do that. Um, he justified the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939 in August, which was effectively an alliance between Stalin and um, uh, Hitler for uh, a peaceful, to stop them fighting each other, but also to divide up Poland, although he didn't know the secret clauses that uh, made that happen. He, but he, what, he parted company with Stalin when Stalin ordered communist parties to uh, approach the war after it broke out in September 1939 as a fight between two capitalist nations or three, England and France, Britain and France on one side and uh, Germany on the other side. Uh, and um, to have no part in it. And he was a patriotic Englishman. Um, he, he was uh, really appalled by this. He's kept quiet about it, but he, he thought, uh, no, this is a fight for decency, a fight against the horrors and evils of, of, of Nazism. Of course, he was an admirer of the Soviet Union, um, but he also admired Churchill, interestingly enough, in his diary. He, he has very positive things to say about Churchill's war leadership. So it's quite a complicated kind of relationship. Yeah. And you, you note in the book that uh, he, he came on MI5's radar. Could we talk a bit about that? Because they seem to become uh, interested in him in his, the later part of his army career and leading into the 1950s. So what was it that brought Eric Hobsbawm onto MI5's radar? Well, first of all, he was in touch with a, a German communist who fled Germany. Uh, and or an Austrian communist rather who'd, who'd fled Central Europe uh, after Austria was taken over by, by the Nazis. And that aroused their suspicion because they were keeping tabs on this, this guy. And then uh, he was a political education officer in the Royal Engineers and he studied and then in the um, Army Educational Corps and he uh, put up wall newspapers. It's quite a common uh, phenomenon in the British Army that to keep the troops informed there were, uh, there were these homemade wall newspapers stuck up on the, on the, the notice board in the mess. And uh, he started urging a second front. Stalin was very keen after the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941 on the British uh, invading. And then with Americans after December, they came into the war invading from the West. And so it was felt that his propaganda and, uh, to the troops was, would cause trouble. This is a decision had to be left to the government and they weren't ready for it. They didn't have the troops, the equipment, they weren't assembled. It didn't happen, of course, until June 1944. So they then opened a file. And on, in total, there were seven files on Eric Hobsbawm, of which the last one is too recent. They have a 50 year rule of access, but I've read the six, the first six. Um, and they, they basically controlled his whole career. They moved him from place to place. They, they're the ones who put him into the Army Educational Corps. Um, and when he started being political there, they sent him to teach German to uh, guards officers. Um, and then after that, they sent him to a military hospital as far away from policy as he could possibly get. Okay, he had no idea. He knew he was being locked over. He knew he was being under surveillance, but he didn't, he didn't know it was MI5. Completely pointless, I should say. He was totally harmless. They, but he was sort of not, not quite British, didn't quite have a British accent. His parents were not, you know, his mother was not British. Um, and he didn't, he wasn't a sort of conventional English public schoolboy like Burgess, Blunt, Philby and McLean, who were literally getting away with murder uh, and informing the Soviet Union, all kinds of secrets, but they got away with it until very late on, well after the war. So Richard, if we could talk now about uh, Eric Hobsbawm's academic output. Now, many of his works, such as The Age of Capital, The Age of Revolution, are still in print today, and they've been widely popular at the time and continue to be very popular internationally. What do you put that international success down to? Uh, 
Eric Hosson was a Marxist, but he was never a dogmatic or Stalinist Marxist. And also because of all this massive amount of reading he'd done in his teenage years and continued to do in the literature, um, he always had a much broader approach. He had a terrific interest in uh, music, especially jazz, and in art, though he wasn't very keen on very modern art. And he used to go and visit the galleries. So he had a sort of breadth and depth of, uh, of, of cultural knowledge and experience, which feeds into the books. So they're never just Marxist books. He was also introduced early on by Poston to the Annal school of French historians who thought that history should encompass everything, not just politics or the economy, society, culture, the arts, intellectual things, philosophy, science, and, and all the rest of it. They regarded history as a central social science, which is Poston also treated history as a social science, and he included Marx as a social scientist. So all of this is hugely influential on, on, on Hobbes form. Uh, so if you look at his books, they combine interpretation and argument uh, and, and quite often in, in, in a Marxist way, but sometimes more broad and more general and certainly not dogmatic. He knew a lot about poetry and he assimilated that. So you've got this combination of knowledge, style and example. Um, and they're, they're very uh, stimulating and enjoyable books to read. And they have unusually for history books lasted. Um, the Age of Revolution came out in 1962 and uh, it's still in print, it's still being read. So Richard, there are um, many things I would like to ask you about Eric Hobsbawm. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the time to do it. So as things are winding down, I would just like to ask you what Eric Hobsbawm's legacy is in an academic sense. He died uh, not long ago in 2012 at the age of 95, covered a lot in his life as you do in the book. Can you tell us what you think his academic legacy is? His legacy academically and, and for the discipline of history is quite difficult to pin down because he didn't create a school of historians. If you look at his PhD students, for example, he supervised quite a lot, but they, they wrote on so many disparate subjects. Um, he tended to attract radicals and, and, and left-wingers, but they were in, all over the place. They worked on Latin America, on Europe, on British history and so on. I think it's much more the influence he had on my generation of historians, particularly whom he and his uh, fellow English Marxist historians, Christopher Hill, Rodney Hilton, Victor Kinn, and John Savile, Edward Thompson in particular, they came out with their major books in the 1960s uh, and onwards. And that was just when I and my generation were coming into the universities and starting our own careers. Uh, and it's that approach which I described that he has, that we, I think, have all tried to copy or adapt ourselves. So when I write my own history books, I try and cover a broad range of topics. It's not just politics or diplomacy or the economy, it's, it's everything, culture and so on. So I've written three volume history of Nazi Germany and a, a, a fairly lengthy penguin history of 19th century Europe called The Pursuit of Power, where I try and put these, in, these, these ideas into effect have a kind of uh, interpretation all the way through, an argument, examples, anecdotes, stories, particularly quotations, a wide range. So in my 19th century Europe, I tried to cover the whole of Europe from Iceland all the way down, down to Cyprus, as it were. Uh, and uh, it, it's, um, although we're not kind of Hobbesbormians, um, I think his influence has been enormous on my generation of historians, and I hope it's continuing to work its way through to subsequent generations too. And I think that this work, Eric Hobsbawm, The Life and History, is perhaps something that will turn subsequent generations of historians on to Hobsbawm's work. So Richard Evans, thank you for coming to speak to me today. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Thank you. Great pleasure.